Okay, so I was asked to talk about uh, black spot management and distribution. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the disease symptoms, where the disease is found in the state currently, the cycle um, and suppression methods, uh, some work on fungicidal control, and then a little bit about the copper model just sort of to remind uh, people about that and how it can be used in controlling black spot among other diseases. So the symptoms of this disease, which is our newest disease in the state, um, is that it's usually found on the maturing fruit. It's unusual to see the uh, hard spots, which is the most characteristic lesion, more than two months before maturity, but the infections occur actually months in advance, so probably six to four, four to six months prior to symptom expression. We get exposure to sunlight, increases the uh, lesion number and the warm temperatures, also increases the disease severity, so that's above approximately 81 degrees Fahrenheit. And often you will see these the symptoms occur on the sun, what they say, the sunny side of the tree, and, uh, and that's where it shows up first, and it'll eventually spread around the uh, other side of the tree or into shadier parts of the growth for uh, full symptom expression. And it doesn't actually get much more severe, but just shows up there first. Um, so for an example of how the warm weather tends to stimulate disease development, in December 2012 we had fairly warm weather above 80 degrees generally uh, for the first part of the month and we started to see symptom development quite heavily in some of the affected groves and to the point where we're getting a lot of the virulent spot and fruit drop. Um, so the symptoms were slower this year in 2013-2014 with the cool, cooler temperatures and we didn't see as much uh, severe disease as we had prior with the warmer temperatures. So uh, some of the symptoms here, uh, we've got crack, hard spot. I'm not sure that the pointer is working, unfortunately, but uh, so up on the upper right-hand corner is the hard spots. They are the round circular lesions. They're approximately quarter of an inch or smaller. In size, they have a brown, dark brown, chocolate brown uh, uh, halo, and they uh, or uh, lesions border, and they will, or they will sometimes be brick red, and then when they're younger, and then you see the pinpoint lesions in the middle, and sometimes they'll have a green halo. Uh, we also see crack spot, which is somewhat unique to the Americas. It's an interaction between black spot and uh, citrus mite and uh, they get these large, flat, diffuse lesions. Sometimes they form the, uh, form the hard spots in the centers and they have concentric circles in them. False melanose and virulent spot are two of the other symptoms that you see. Uh, you can get uh, false melanose, looks quite a bit like its other namesake, the real melanose. The biggest symptom difference is the um, false melanose tends to be a little bit smoother to the touch when it's not too severe and it's darker brown. Uh, sort of more chocolate brown rather than the rust red of true melanose. But it's really hard to tell the difference, so we don't ask people to diagnose based on that symptom. Um, it will show up on green fruit as well as uh, ripe fruit, uh, as does crack spot. And then the last symptom, which is probably the biggest concern for anyone packing fresh fruit, is the virulent spot because it's the one that can go, uh, you can pick clean looking fruit, pack it, and then when they open the containers up at the other end, uh, they'll have these lesions on it. It's a virulent spot. Uh, it can cover a good circumference of the fruit surface. Uh, so those are the main symptom types of black spot. The leaf symptoms and stem symptoms occur. The leaf symptoms are uncommon but present at low levels with little to low control measures in a grove. But they're most commonly found on highly susceptible cultivars like lemons but can be found on any cultivar, and often on leaves that are near senescence. Um, and they'll be sort of the leaves that sort of look a little tired and faded, uh, but not the really vibrant green. They're small reddish-brown lesions, again, uh, under a quarter inch in size, in diameter. Tan centers will form as the lesions age, although not necessarily, and the older lesions will have that dark brown margin sometimes with the large yellow halo, and they're sort of a cinnamon brown color. And you can see the leaf lesions um, on uh, up there, and they're sort of that little cinnamon, tiny brown dots. Unfortunately, they're hard to photograph e easily. Um, and then you get these stem lesions as well that look a lot like hard spot, but I've not actually ever seen stem lesions in the groves here in Florida, although I keep looking to see if we'll ever see that particular symptom. 
So where is the disease sped, spread within the state? Um, DPI was very kind to share this uh, slide with me. And uh, our original sites were found in the red. Those were the ones that were found in 2009-2010 season. Uh, remembering that when, when black spot was first found, it was quite late in the season. It was uh, mid to late March, showing up uh, just south of Immokalee, and then along 842, or along the road, uh, in a block of grapefruit. Then further spread in 2010 and 11, as we expected, we found further uh, locations with the uh, disease um, for, sort of spread around a little bit because we were then able to go through and have our DPI was able to go through and inspect blocks of things like Hamlin and such, some of the earlier cultivars, and there was a lot more fruit on the trees. Um, things sort of settled out a little bit in 2011-2012. Uh, we didn't see a huge amount of spread in that year or in 2012, 2000, or 11, 2000, 2012, 2013, sorry. Um, we didn't see a huge amount of spread in those years, uh, but you do see that the quarantines are, are steadily expanding up towards uh, Felda and uh, along 29, which is a little bit concerning, and, and they're slowly expanding outwards from the original locations. Um, and then this last year, we've had a bit more... Uh, more disease again this year, which is a little unfortunate, um, and, and a lot more orange in some further locations. So this disease is slowly making its way out of its original locations in southwest Florida, although fortunately it's not doing it huge, very, very quickly. Um, but this is probably the, the parts of the original infection that we just hadn't found up until now. So in Polk County, we did have one incursion right near the Polk Highlands um, border, uh, and it's been one block uh, with one tree with, I think, a couple of fruit in it that were infected. These fruit were, um, and, then, uh, and then DPI has done, I think, six scouts through there since that time and in that area, and so far have not found anything. So, uh, so far, the disease sort of has gone underground again, uh, although I expect that it will pop itself back up at some point again in the future, which is unfortunate. Um, and now, for European concerns, Polk County is now considered a quarantine county, so in shipping any fresh fruit out of Polk has become more complicated than it had been private previously to, uh, to places like Europe. So disease cycle and suppression. So black spot uh, is caused by a fungus called Gennardia citricarpa. It has a somewhat complicated life cycle, but it starts sort of at the top of the life cycle uh, with the leaf drop. So just we're just coming out of the leaf drop now. The dead leaves are on the orchard floor. They're starting to decompose. And as they're decomposing, they're producing the structures that form the ascospores, which are the uh, sexual stage spores. Uh, these are ejected during wedding events uh, up into the air. They're airborne. They then travel to the remaining parts of the, of the fruit and trees. Um, you then form these structures that pierce into the, the leaf tissue called aprosoria, and then the disease sort of goes silent until we get into that maturing phase. Then we start to see that uh, disease, the symptoms form. You get the pycnidia, which are the secondary cycle, so we're on the loop back. Uh, we get the pycnidia, they form the conidia. Those are the asexual spores, and they will amplify the disease in the cycle. So the first, the first symptoms come from the uh, Ascospores, then the second symptoms come from the pycnidia spores. And then it just amplifies the amount of disease found in the grove, and then the whole cycle continues again around the next year. So the major inoculum source uh, is the decomposing leaf litter, or the ascospores. The in additional inoculum source are the lesions on the infected fruit leaves, leaf litter, and branches. So those are the canidia, so they can be found on most parts of the tree. Uh, the means of spread are the ascospores is through wind, and then um, water splash are for the ascospores canidia. And the fungus survives within the leaves, leaf litter, branches, fruits, and peduncles. So pretty much through most parts of the tree except for the main uh, scaffolds and roots. As I said, the leaves are nearly symptomless, so on oranges and tangerines, if there's any chemical control used, it's extremely rare to see the leaf symptoms. That does not mean, though, that they are not infected and a certain proportion of these will harbor the organism. Uh, so even though you can't see it, it doesn't mean that the disease is not there or the fungus is not there. 
When, you, when symptomatic trees are removed, as some people are still doing, uh, you're not likely removing the disease from the growth. You're just making things feel better, and you're actually removing that one tree that probably has the majority of the inoculum, but you're not getting rid of the whole organism out of the growth. So you need to balance at some point between the cost of the loss of trees between your likely replant success with HLB, depending on where you are and what kind of uh, situation you're in in the neighborhood, and then the cost of living with black spot. So, the, so that's why we talk about a lot of a lot about plant debris movement. It needs to be minimized coming out of these quarantine areas uh, to reduce spread. Tarping is necessary for for re disease reduction. If I had my way, I'd have everyone tarp. Um, and we're starting to see tarping machine prototypes built. I know some of the haulers hauling out of that area are now using uh, tarping machines on at least some of their vehicles to reduce cost and uh, safety safety risks for their personnel. And then uh, all vehicles and equipment need to go through decontamination materials. Uh, quartering ammonia, just like we have for canker, is, is still a viable um, measure. And then it would be ideal if we had fruit loads cleaned before they even got into the truck, so there was less concern of the leaf debris flying out of the trucks on the road. Um, we see greater twig breakage now that the, with HLV, twigs seem to be becoming more brittle, so you're getting more debris within the, within the loads, and so that's not good for uh, movement of, of black spot. Tree health, uh, the declining trees are more symptomatic, uh, possibly more susceptible to the disease, certainly more symptomatic. These declining trees should be removed if they are to the point where they're not giving you any kind of profit anyway. Because, and the cause of this decline is unimportant, be it HLB, phytophthora, blight, what have you. Um, it doesn't really, black spot doesn't really care. Um, so anything that can maintain good tree health is a good practice for black spot suppression, uh, be it nutritional, pest and disease control, or horticultural. Cultural controls, including leaf litter management, are being investigated. Uh, this is some of my older data with the uh, leaf litter control, and in the white bars we have the untreated controls in our small plots, um, and then in the green bars, which is our best performing treatment, we had 5% urea in our small plots, and we're going to be putting out uh, some of these treatments this uh, spring, actually very shortly. So we'll be able to tell you whether this works on a larger scale rather than just in my small plots for disease control. Fungicide control is a major component of black spot control. Um, we've look, been looking at in vitro assays, looking at new products for uh, trying to bring into the, for, for black spot control new products, if there are anything that are viable in vitro, but then also looking at how sensitive the native population of black spot is to various fungicides. This is quite important for uh, resistance management. Um, I don't. I'm sure many of you heard me speak before about Alternaria brown spot and uh, resistance to strobilurins. Um, and strobilurins are really our only other control measure than copper currently registered for black spot, so we want to try and be good stewards of this. Since we don't know where black spot came from, we don't know what its history is in exposure to, to strobilurins, so it was important for us to find out how uh, sensitive the, fun the fungus was to the um, to the strobilurin so that we could monitor this over the years to make sure that we're not developing resistance. Um, the good news was from these studies and uh, here is that uh, we're looking at our uh, effective concentration that was good for killing 50% of the uh, mycelium and, and the good news is that all of our isolates were highly sensitive to both pyracostrobin and azoxystrobin. And so we now have this information in hand for future resistance monitoring. Um, a probably more immediate interest to growers is looking at the uh, actual control in the field. This is work done by Pam Roberts and KAC Consulting with Henry Yachts. And they did a large field trial. They've done several years of field trials. This is the results from March 20th in 2013. And right in the middle they have their untreated control. And you'll see that there's a large number of treatments there that go um, I'll put the letters A all the way through to D, and uh, none of these ice, none of these uh, products are uh, are uh, statistically different from the untreated control. However, we start to see some separation with those shorter bars towards the bottom of the graph. 
if I had a point or I'd point. But um, so we get fairly reasonable results out of enable a citrus oil and then COSI 3000 alternated uh, enable a citrus oil put on at the same time, new cop and quadrus top alternated, gem um, enable and citrus oil uh, or alternated, um, MBI, which is some kind of biological pyroclostrobin or headline and coside mixed with an NIS alternated amongst treatments, and then pristine alternated with COSI 3000 and COSI 3000 alternated with quadrus top. So all of these were highly effective, uh, better control than uh, the uh, than the untreated control, and they, they looked quite promising in keeping the uh, severity down on the tree. Um, and then also she looked at the number of fruit underneath the tree, how many had fallen off. So one of the big symptoms of black spot is, uh, for processing particularly, is the amount of fruit that fall off the tree. Uh, there have been reports of up to 80% in, in parts of Brazil, which is pretty bad. Uh, fortunately, we've never seen much worse than 30%, but that's still a big hit. So uh, at the top, we have our untreated control. So we had the most number of fruit falling off on the untreated control. But we don't see any significant difference till we get down to some of those shorter bars with the COSI 3000 and wash guard, enable enablement citrus oil at um, a pristine and COSI, uh, COSI 3000 quadrus top, and the uh, MBI headline and COSI combination. So all of those seem to work pretty well, and so there's some promising results. And I know they're repeating some of these treatments to make sure that that wasn't just a a coincidence for the one year, so we've got to repeat that to make sure we have at least two years of viable data. So, it, um, so we're investigating in vitro and field products for efficacy, both products that are registered, but also we're look, now looking at products that are not registered uh, in citrus to be able to monitor uh, both for resistance development, but also trying to find good products to even bring out to the in vitro trials. Uh, we're currently testing DMI fungicides, five of them for efficacy and baseline sensitivity. Uh, those are the next round of fungicides. Uh, that includes products like Quadrus Top, which carries a DMI. It's a mixture. Um, but the backbone of our black spot program is really still copper. Um, copper residue, though, is significantly reduced by rain washing. It doesn't move once it is dried. Uh, the copper residue and the copper residue is cracked by fruit growth, so you need to continuously apply it um, as time goes on in the season. So this, we built the scheduler myself and Clyde Frazee re uh, vitalized the scheduler. It had really originally been designed by Pete Timmer, Jean Albrigo, and Howard Beck, and uh, we we, uh, we ended up having to revitalize it because it was a standalone uh, program that was no longer working well on. Um, uh, on current uh, operating systems, uh, it was, I think, designed for Windows 98, and we were now into, we had XP was discontinued as of today. Um, so it was getting harder and harder to work with. So this now incorporates the rainfall data from Fawn, incorporates data on copper residue degradation, and then incorporates fruit growth size and calculates the residue degrade, uh, decay, and it uses Florida-specific algorithms uh, for, for fruit growth. So, the, of course, using copper, you need to remember to look at the label rates, look at how, how, what is recommended for the disease, because a lot of the coppers have different recommendations for different diseases. And then, of course, being cautious in hot weather. If you're process or you're planning to pack for fresh, then you really need to be cautious in those hot weathers above 94 degrees Fahrenheit. You get phytotoxicity more quickly in hot weather. And then also, you can reduce that potential, though, with using a greater volume of water per acre, although it does cost more, of course. Complex tank mixes, including oil applications and nutritional materials, can contribute to phytotoxicity. I always recommend doing something like a jar test before you mix up a, a cocktail to make sure that the copper isn't reacting with something else or you're having an interaction that makes your acidity go way down in the copper solution because that can promote phytotoxicity. Um, aerial applications are not likely to get adequate penetration for the for this control uh, this disease. So the best method of application is an air blast sprayer. Some of the more modern features, well, we're 
using a web-based program, no longer than that st the standalone program. The interface is user-friendly. Uh, we've got easier data input than previously. Uh, it's available uh, from either the AgriClimate or Fawn websites, and you can use it in conjunction with the Citrus Pest application tool on Fawn, which will give you a uh, preview of the next 45 hours on when is a good time to spray and when is not. And we also have a mobile version. So if you go online from your, your phone, it will automatically take you to the mobile version. So just to give you an idea of how this is working, so I, I used 21-day calendar schedule for last year, 2013, in Lake Alfred, Lake Alfred uh, on Valencia with a bloom of uh, March 19th in, in 2013. We used 0.75 metallic uh, copper in 125 gallons per acre. Those are the defaults, but they're also quite commonly used. And, and we found that there were significant gaps um, in May, June, and July. And you may not be able to see them that well. It's when the curve slips down below the uh, red line, uh, but they're being masked a little bit by the large amount of rain and the blue bars at the bottom. So it's hard to see some of the red gaps because of the blue bars, but they are there. So and these are the peak control times for greasy spot and melanose. And, but then looking at application based on the model in 2013, I used the exact same criteria, so same bloom, scion, bloom date, and uh, quantities, and then I just triggered it to go to do the next application when we hit the 0.25 micrograms per copper uh, per fruit area. Um, and that is the, when you hit that red bar or that red line. Is, is that point, and the gaps of the coverage were eliminated without any uh, further applications. So you can actually increase your your, appli or your ep application efficacy without actually costing yourself anything more, although I do have the luxury of I don't have to find anybody or equipment on a specific day. Um, however, you could still sort of come close to doing that in, in a real-time situation provided your acreage is not too large. Um, we also looked in some part of the study was looking to make sure that our application volume was best. And we used 55 years worth of historical data to do this. And we kept all of the variables the same except we varied the volume one, one at a time, one notch at a time. And so we used 0.75 pounds per acre of metallic copper, a 21 day application using the Mandarin cyan because that was our worst case scenario in this study. It was the the one where we got the least uh, effective coverage and inside the canopy. And then we, we showed that uh, at the bottom of that curve is our best, um, our best performing point, and uh, it, it corresponded quite nicely with the 125 gallon per acre. So that looks like it's a pretty effective volume for disease management for optimal copper application, at least with the historical data. Copper concentration, um, all, again, we kept all the variables the same except for this time we were looking at our uh, amount of copper. So we used 125 gallons per acre, again, the same application schedule, the mandarin, cyan, and inside canopy fruit with the, uh, historical data. Here the results weren't quite as clear. You can see my line shows where the 0.75 pounds per acre is. Uh, you could probably go up to one to one and quarter pounds per acre and still be within sort of an optimal range. So, but it still looks like the recommendations hold up at least over the historical data. And hopefully as we continue on in the, for, the forward that uh, 0.75 pounds an acre is still going to give pretty reasonable coverage. So the current 21 day calendar schedule is not optimally timed in most years to predict our fruit. Um, and not because it isn't good on average, in fact it's the best on average, but unfortunately most years aren't an average year. Um, and so they tend, you tend to get gaps in the coverage in the beginning of the seasons. Um, citrus copper application schedule can, at least in ideal conditions, further increase the protection and save spray in dry, dry years. Um, but can it also be used with that citrus pesticide application tool to best time your applications? And uh, we were able to confirm that 125 gallons per acre and 0.75 pounds per acre application volumes and rates were optimal for application efficacy. So looking at some of the data we've taken over the 2011-2012 uh, um, for copper, so one of the reasons we're doing this is that the 
original copper model sort of stopped in early July, and that's because it was designed for sort of melanos and some of the earlier fungal diseases that did not need applications past that period. Now we have uh, black spot and canker, and so we need to know how well the, the, uh, the copper sprays are holding up over the, over the summer period. And so we're looking at uh, the two years. So this is Valencia data, and my green line is where the yellow was in the actual model, and then the red line is at the 0.25 micrograms, or yeah, 0.25 micrograms per centimeter squared morning level. And then we put out applications every 21 days, and you can see that with my arrows. Uh, I think in 2011 we had a couple, 28 days. Um, but you can see that we didn't slip very far below that that uh, uh, 20 uh, that red line. So it looks like at least if you go by the uh, every 21 days during the summer, you should be pretty safe. We're trying to optimize that now, uh, but the growth curves for the summer are not going to be the same, and so we're still working on some of that to get it incorporated into the original model and eventually extend the model all the way through to September. Um, so as I said, we're going to incorporate this future growth data. The three seasons of, of residue have been collected. Um, we're going to be adding a new copper formulation this year to make sure that it works the same way as the cuprous hydroxide that we've been using, uh, or the copper hydroxide. We are still working on trying to get uh, data to be served on the servers so that you can, don't need to input the information every time you want to use the model in the year. Um, and then send alerts uh, if people want that. And then also a login service so that that stays confidential within your operation. Uh, but then also you'll be able to have as many blocks as you wanted. Um, this has turned out to be more complicated than I had any ideas about. Um, in, in the computing world, so this is still a in, in work in progress. Coming back to black spot, greater management efforts are going to be needed for this disease. No easy fixes or solutions are on the horizon. Um, it will require an integrative approach uh, from the things like leaf litter management, fungicide applications, tools to aid application timing and removal of declining trees. There will be no one single management method that will be possible for this uh, disease. There are no silver bullets. And I will remind you that this is not going to stay a South Florida problem. This is going to spread throughout most of the state, hopefully very slowly, but eventually it will get there. Uh, and so we don't want to make the same mistakes as we heard with HLB, where it's going to be a South Florida problem. No, it won't, won't be there. And this is the disease that Brazil actually spends the most money in controlling. It's not HLB, it's black spot. So I just want to quickly say that we were supported generously by APHIS, the Citrus Initiative, Syngenta Crop Protection, and CRDF, and a few people who have uh, assisted with this project, uh, Mondal, Chao Wahoo, Tasha Rodriguez, and Ken Lasting.